Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we receive it. Written in our heart and mind, thank you for revelation you're bringing forth. We will be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of the New Testament commandments and sayings of Jesus Christ, which is what you and I are ordered to obey and to follow according to the Word of God. And this is a very important series. So I'm doing in-depth study through every single scripture and through the Greek, through looking through and bringing forth the information that is so important for us to know. We begin in John 14, 21. He that has or is having my commandments, present tense verb, meaning continuous, repeated, ongoing action, as we're having his commandments, and how do we get them? By getting in the word, hearing the word, getting them in our heart and mind, and holding fast to them. And then keeping them. That means we do them. We do what he says. Commandments are orders from God laid down as the rule of authority in your life that you are to obey willingly, doing exactly what he commands you to do. He says, he it is that loveth me. That means words mean nothing. It's shown by action, isn't it? Of obeying his commandments and keeping them. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. I will love him and will manifest myself to him. We want to see that. We have to meet the conditions to see God bring that forth. We also see in verse 23, Jesus answered, said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Not only his commandments, but his words or his sayings. And my father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him, which is what we want to see in our life today and to see God accomplish the great work that he is going to bring forth in the body of Christ to raise up this glorious, perfected, holy, mighty end time church. We're going to continue on. In Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, here's where Jesus said to his disciples, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That is important for us to realize. Everything that you learn from God is going to be by revelation, not by you figuring something out yourself. It's by spiritual revelation. The Father reveals the truth to you. And he says, I say also unto, unto you, thou art Peter, by the way, this is the word Petros, and upon this rock, not Petros, but Petra, speaking of the rock of revelation knowledge that comes from hearing and doing the word, not upon a person. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When again he talks about this rock. We can see this when it talks about it. Matthew 7, 24. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, doeth them. I'll liken to a wise man to build his house upon a rock. This is the word Petra. And who, how do you build your house on a rock? By hearing and doing the word of God. So this is not talking about a person whatsoever. <laughs> Those, that whole group that is, thinks that, it's, that Peter was the head of the church is such a lie, totally contrary to the word of God. These, they're a false church, you know. And upon this rock, the rock of revelation from hearing and doing the word, I will build my church. If you are going to see God's work be done in your life, it's going to be built by God through revelation knowledge of the word, which comes not just by hearing, but by hearing and doing the word of God. And notice, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, or not have be strong against it to prevail against it or to be able to overcome it. Because as you get the revelation knowledge of the word in you, you will be full of power and might and you will operate in that with the authority delegated to us and you will conquer every work of the enemy. Doesn't matter what the enemy tries to bring against you 
and you will be able to conquer everything, every area where the enemy has established anything. You can cast it down, pull it down, throw it down, root it out, see it be removed, see it be eliminated, crushed underfoot, because you and I have authority. Therefore, we must get revelation knowledge. The key will be you hearing and doing the Word of God consistently in your life. We come to verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things, the elders and chief priests and scribes be killed, be raised again the third day. Jesus is speaking the truth of what's going to happen. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Don't ever speak against the word of God or reject what the word says. It is the truth, whether you understand it or not. He obviously didn't understand what this is all about. But he spoke against them, and that was wrong. He turned and said unto Peter, speaking to the person, Get thee behind me, Satan. That means the devil can be in a person and speaking through a person. Anytime a person would be speaking contrary to the word of God, it's the devil speaking through them. It's not God. Just because they're born again even, doesn't matter. The devil can speak through anybody who's speaking contrary to the word. And you must recognize that. He said, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, or be mindful, this refers to, but the, those that be of men. He was mindful of things of men instead of the things that be of God. Don't ever speak according to your reasoning in your mind. You want to speak according to the wisdom of God, the Word of God, what is truth. Of course, he made a big mistake speaking this. Don't resist what Jesus said, and don't be minding the things of men. Make sure you're minding the things of God at all times. We come to verse 24. Jesus said unto his disciples, and the disciples, remember, the ones who are truly following him. If any man wills, this is the main verb in this particular clause here, because it is the, what's called the indicative mood, the statement of making a, a statement of an occurrence, a reality, or a fact. And the present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So if any man is willing continuously to come, this is an infinitive in the Greek, and Greek infinitives are just like English infinitives, to come after me. This is why Young translates it this way. And that tells you the first step. You set your will. You're going to continually come after Jesus. If your will is not set to come after him and seek after him, there's something wrong. If you're seeking after other things, there's something wrong. You're to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You already saw that. And you set your will, you're going to come after him. What's the next thing you do? Let him deny himself. When you deny yourself, this means to lose sight of oneself and one's own interests. Otherwise, my agenda is not what I'm following after. I'm following after God's agenda. I am denying myself. I'm losing sight of myself and my own interests. I'm putting the Word of God first place in what's priority in life, following His commands and His orders and doing what He has told me to do. That's what God wants. And also, what else does He do? He takes up His cross. The taking up of the cross means something which is being put to death, because on the cross, something was put to death. What's been put to death? All the deeds of the body. You are to take up your cross and crucify the flesh and put to death all the deeds of the body. Because what's the problem of the body? Sin dwells in the flesh. <laughs> you can't be yielding to the body. You'll be walking in sin. And follow me. This is one who follows as a disciple. If you follow him, you put his word first place and you hear and do it. And then he says, whosoever will save his suke, soul-directed life, he will destroy it. Whosoever will destroy or put out of the way his soul realm 
directed life. I'm running it from my mind, will, or emotions. She'll find it. We must not run our life from our will, intellect, or emotions. We must run it from the Spirit. Everything is to be operating in the Spirit according to the Word of God. What does a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose or damage, this means, his own soul? You damage it every time you walk contrary to the way of the Spirit. What shall man give in exchange for his soul? He can't. <laughs> Nothing he can do. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. We're going to be rewarded according to our works. If, of course, as long as our works are the right things, we could also have damage, you know, and lose rewards if we are not walking according to his ways. So, set your will that you're going to come after him. Deny yourself. Lose sight of your own interests. Put him first place in all things. Crucify the flesh daily. Follow after him, putting the word first place. Make sure that you destroy a soul realm directed life and you're only walking after the Spirit according to the Word and do all that He's commanded you. And He will reward you according to your works. One other scripture in a different area, which is a different, in Mark, talking about the same subject, Mark chapter 8, verse 38, he said, Whosoever therefore will be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. We can't be ashamed of him or of his words. We must do them. However you treat him is the way he's going to treat you. Remember, that's the way a covenant works. That's why it says he'll be ashamed of you. We must put the Word of God first place in everything that we do. We come to Matthew chapter 17, and we need to get this understanding of what he's talking about. He says, after six days, and what is a day as? A day as is a thousand years. Six days. What's that really pointing towards? It's a revelation of the fact after the 6,000 years of man's existence, which is what's going to happen after that, when Jesus then is going to be able to take his authority back. And during that time, next time, he's going to come and he's going to bring forth the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. Notice what it says. Jesus takes Peter and James and John, his brother, and brings them up to a high mountain apart. Well, that's only three of the disciples. Well, they were the ones who were the close ones that were really following him. That speaks of those who are going to be in this company, only the ones who were truly following him, not just ones who were called to be a disciple, but the ones that truly were disciples. And they were transfigured before him, changed. What's that point towards? You and I are going to have a time when we're going to be changed. Amen. We're going to get a brand new body. We're going to get a glorified body at the rapture, the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. His face did shine as the sun, his raiment was white as lightning. And then it says, Behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias or Elijah talking with him. First of all, you must realize this wasn't Moses and Elias themselves appearing before him because verse 9 says, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision. This is simply a vision. It wasn't him actually appearing to him. It was a vision to no man. So, we go back here, and he talks about, notice he says Moses first, and he says Elijah second. This is talking about the rapture. What's this pointing towards? What's Moses and Elijah represent? Moses is one who died. Elijah is one who didn't die. Moses represents all of the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints who will have died, who will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And who caught, gets caught up first and changed? He's the dead in Christ. That's why he's listed first. And Elijah represents those who are alive because he didn't die. 
Well, that would be the ones who were alive remaining at the time of the coming of Jesus Christ. So this is talking about the New Testament saints that are alive at that time that will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Of course, they didn't understand this. One thing, though, we know that when this is talking about time-wise, because Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If thou wilt, well, let us make your three tabernacles. Why would he talk about tabernacles? Because it was at the time of the season of tabernacles, which is the seventh month time. And that's, of course, when trumpets occurs, which is the rapture, the catching up of the church. That's the fulfillment of it. So, of course, that's when the Lord, the Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And so here, of course, they came down, and what did they think? The disciples said, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? Why would they say that? Because they saw Moses first and then Elijah second. And they said, Oh, I don't understand. Why? Elijah's supposed to come first. Well, they didn't understand that that was talking about the Old Testament and New Testament saints who had died and the New Testament saints who were still alive were going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the rapture. They thought that. They didn't understand this. This is talking about the fact that Elijah, which is pointing towards John the Baptist, had already come. And then, of course, Jesus explained that to him. Elijah's already come. And then it says, Then the disciples understood he spake to them of John the Baptist as a forerunner. But that's not what was happening here. It was talking about the dead Old Testament and New Testament saints and the ones who would be alive caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, and also the dead in Christ, of course, are going to rise first. That's why that was. Just for your own understanding, some people thought there's a contradiction. Mark chapter 9, verse um, 2. After six days, Jesus takes with him Peter and James and John, goes up there. So both of these talk about six days. But when we come over to, and by the way, this word in each case, after, is meta, which means after. It's talking about at a specific time. When we come over to Luke chapter 9, it says something different. You must understand that Luke is the one who really brought forth the specific, precise chronology according to time. In Luke chapter 9, verse 28, it says it came to pass about an out eight days after these sayings. And when it says about, this means a, a, like as, or it's the word Jose, which means really even approximately eight days after these sayings. So this is apparently two days before the others were speaking of the six days. There isn't a contradiction. This is just talking about a different time period that he is looking at, but it's talking about the very same thing when he took them up to the mountain. Some people have thought, well, it looks like there's an error there. No, there's not an error there. This is just talking about a different time period than what the other two were talking about, eight days before, after these sayings that were given. So there is no contradiction whatsoever. Luke, we'll get, as we will look at later on, we'll begin to look at Luke chapter 1 and follow through. He gave precise, accurate direction of what had happened and the order of events that had occurred, and he speaks of that. We go over to Matthew chapter 17 now, as we're sticking in Matthew, verse 15. Here's where the man comes to Jesus, and he's got a son that's a lunatic. He says, Father, my, have mercy on my son. And remember, Jesus spoke commands continually, and the people that came to him spoke commands as well. They were making commands according to covenant. He said, have mercy, he called him Lord, on my son. And he's a parrot of mood. He's making a command to Jesus. Remember that everything that we do in covenant relationship, we're making demands or commands according to that which is the covenant promises. These are demands or commands that we take hold of. In the New Testament, we pointed that out. The word aiteo is a word meaning a demand of something's do us. And these guys were making commands. 
That's all you see. You don't see people come in and asking. They come and make commands. That's why you and I make commands and demands of what's due us when we come to take hold of promises. Because that's the way you function according to law, we pointed out, spiritual law. And you, we are functioning according to spiritual law in the covenant relationship we have with him. Everything operates according to spiritual law. He's a lunatic and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falls in the fire and off in the water. I brought him to the disciples and they could not cure him. They didn't have the power, dunamai to cure him. They should have. Look what Jesus said. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? That's the statement of someone who expected them to successfully have dealt with that situation. They should have. They were expected to. Why not? They weren't in order. God expects you and I to get in order so that we see all the works of God be done. We don't want to be a faithless, perverse generation. We should be doing the very same works and seeing them get done. How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And of course, Jesus makes continual commands when he says, bring him, bring him to me. Imperative mood. He spoke, spoke commands constantly. And he rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. He commanded that devil, charged him sharply to come out of him. And that's exactly what we do. We command the demons to come out in the mighty name of Jesus. And of course, disciples came apart and says, hey, why couldn't we cast them out? And Jesus told them straightforward, because of your unbelief. We cannot have unbelief. We must believe. We are commanded to believe. Always believe the word, never doubt. Always act on the word, it is the truth. He's given you authority, we should never have any unbelief. So if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say to the mountain, remove hence to yonder place that you remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Because what are you gonna do? You are going to make commands. You're gonna speak commands. Well, obviously, they were in unbelief. They were not able to do it. If we're in unbelief and we're not making commands and we don't understand that our faith is the faith of Jesus that will move everything out of whatever the situation is, we won't see things happen whatsoever. At the same time, he does make a statement. Howbeit this kind, this particular type of spirit, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. That doesn't mean that you need to pray and fast every time you cast out a demon. This is the only case where anybody was told to pray and fast. All the rest of the times, they just cast them out. 99% of all the cases you deal with, you just command them to come out in the name of Jesus with the authority that you have. There may be some that you need to pray and fast in conjunction with making commands in order to see them come out. What does fasting do? Fasting silences the flesh to release spiritual power out of you so you don't have any hindrances. That's why the prayer, building you up, strengthening you, and the fasting, getting to the place of releasing maximum spiritual power out of you will be necessary in a case like this to see the person be delivered and set free. We also see it over in Mark's account, chapter 9, verse 17. When the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee thy son, which has a dumb spirit. And wherever he taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. Demons can do that to people. I spake to the disciples, they should cast him out, and they could not. This is a different word. It's not the word dunamai. It's the word iskowo. They didn't have strength or mighty force to do it. Because remember, you get power and you get mighty force in you through the word, so that you are going to be able to conquer every enemy. Well, this guy... Of course, he said the same thing. He answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring them unto me. He expected them to deal with it. God expects us to be able to deal with evil spirits and to cast them out. Of course, he brought them to him, and even in the face of Jesus, he, the spirit tore at him, fell on the ground, wallowed foaming. They can manifest, but you command them to come out and get them coming out of that person right away. 
course, then he, just, he spoke to the father and says, how long is it since he came into him? That brings us a revelation. This means from childhood. Uh, we can have demons have come in from childhood. We can have them come in from inheritance, even at the time of conception. We can have demons come in and be in a person for a long time that have done things. And he talks about how he cast them in the fire and all these things. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And again, he's commanding him for help. Mm -hmm. He's speaking a command to him. Help us. That's what we come to take, we come to see God bring forth help. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. It requires believing. Well, straightway the father the child cried out and with tears said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He knew he had some unbelief. Mm -hmm. We've got to get the unbelief out of us. Yes. Get the word in you. Resist all unbelief. Act on the word. Get your faith developed. And take every thought captive and don't give place to anything. Of course, what did Jesus do? Here he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, or I command thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. When he said, come out, he's commanding him to come out of him, telling him what to do. That's what we do. We don't ask them. We command them and order them. And when he said, enter no more, was this a command? No. This is a subjunctive mood verb, meaning and that he might enter him no more. Why would that be? Because... A demon could come back in if you go back into sin or give place to him. We got to make sure that we shut the door and we don't let anything come back into us. God wants us to be delivered and set free. Well, this guy, because of all the things that were manifesting, the spirit cried, read him sore, came out of him, and he was as one dead. They thought he was dead. No, they can, they can actually, demons couldn't cause a person to appear like they've passed out and so forth. No, oh, he took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he rose. If things like this happen, you just cast them out, lift them up in the name of Jesus. Don't be moved by things. Just keep casting out. Make sure that the demons are coming out of the person if you ever deal with a situation like this. You and I have authority. Don't be afraid. And don't let yourself get in doubt or unbelief, regardless of what is going on. Sometimes manifestations cause people to get in fear. No, it's just the demons operating in the person. That means they have a lot of strength. You have dominion over them, remember, and you just cast them out, and they will come out. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. He said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, this isn't really quite the way it should be translated. First of all, each one of these are subjunctive mood verbs. If you might be converted, well, that's the first step, of course, to get turned back to the Lord. And if you might become as little child, subjunctive mood, oh, that means it's got to be more than just be converted to enter into the kingdom. I've got to be humble like a little child to be able, the prideful won't enter in, see. And then he goes on and says that you shall not enter. Well, that's, again, not quite right. He said, again, that you might not enter into the kingdom of heaven, meaning there's, there's, there can even be more conditions. That's why it's a conditional statement. Or well, you could go off and walk in sin. Or you might have been converted and became humble, but then you went off in other directions and didn't do things. Well, you're not going to necessarily enter in. In other words, you've got to meet all the conditions, whatever the conditions are, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is why we've got to look up all of the tenses in order to see what's absolutely being said so we're not deceived. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You and I must humble ourselves. Pride has to be rooted out of your life. Selfishness has to be eliminated. I, 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 me, me mentalities has to be taken underfoot and eliminated. We must walk in his ways. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, 
receiveth me. We need to accept people. I mean, there's, you can't just reject people. No, we're to re receive a little child who says in my name, you're gonna receive me, they're important, see? And then he says, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it's better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. This is where you caused uh, some destructive effect. You offended that person in some way. Well, God wants us to make sure we don't offend people or cause them to stumble. We want to make sure we always point them in the right direction of walking in the way of the Lord. And then we come down to verse 8 and 9. He says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, well, they could be offending you. Cut them off, cast them in from thee, them from thee. It's better for thee to enter in the life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now, he doesn't want us to literally cut them off or whatever. He wants us to deal with anything that our hand might be put to its wrong or our steps we're walking into or also anything that our mind we might be thinking upon or any area, any of our members. Our members need to be yielded unto God and to be walking in the ways of the Lord. And that's so important. If your eye offend thee, that's another of your members. Pluck it out, cast it from thee. Better to have one eye rather than two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed, you despise not one of these little ones. We cannot despise or think little or nothing of someone. Everybody's valuable and precious and important. So we got to always see people from that standpoint. Everybody is valuable, precious, and important. He says, For I say unto you, in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to respond to everybody in the same way, remember, because there can be conditions. This just means the way you're going to view everybody is valuable and precious and important. That's important. Because if someone's not walking right, remember, we're supposed to withdraw from those that walk disorderly. In the same time, we're going to have fellowship with those that are walking right. So you've got to look at all the scriptures together and not try to take some scripture and try to say, you know, uh, take it out of context and not look at and ignore other scriptures to come up with some attitudes that you might have that I'm just supposed to treat everybody good all the time necessarily. Well, I'm going to walk in love toward them and I'm going to think uh, they're valuable and precious, but you're going to know them by their fruit and by their works and all the things they do, aren't we? And are we going to have fellowship with the ones that aren't walking right or no? Not whatsoever. We got to look at everything. Son of man's come to save that which was lost. That's right, the one who is destroying himself. Verse 12 How think ye, if a man of a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety nine and go in the mountains and seek that which has gone astray? Yeah, we want to see people get right with the Lord if they'll listen. If so be that he find it, and verily I say unto you, rejoice more of the sheep than of the ninety-nine that went not astray. Even so, it's not the will of your Father which in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Because what happens if someone goes astray, they perish. Because you can only be right with God if you're following Him. If you're going astray, you're in trouble. This is someone who's going away from the right way, walking contrary to the Word of God. We want to see them come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to perish, which is what will happen to them. But then we come to another situation. Verse 15, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, somebody is a Christian, you go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. You'll hear, if he hears you, gain your brother. That means the fact that he would respond to it and repent and get right. If he will not hear thee, he, he didn't get anywhere in talking to him, then take with one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established or there's no question about what's being said. If he, if, if he shall neglect to hear them, I'm not going to listen to them either. Tell it to the church. If he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. This means someone who won't come to repentance over areas of sin that they can, sit, they can continually walk in, they're to be treated like a heathen a publican. Remember the guy who had incest with his father's wife and he wouldn't repent? He, he, judgment was going to come upon him until he came repent. If they won't come to repentance, that's the way things have to be because a little leaven leavens the whole lump, doesn't it? 
contaminates it. We cannot have, we cannot tolerate sin in our life or in a church. Verily I say unto you, he comes to something else here now. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth or might bind on earth, because you and I are doing things from our position of authority. And remember, we've seen this in Matthew 16, verse 19. This is a little bit different, as you will see. Whatsoever you might bind on earth shall be, having been bound, this is the main verb again, shall be, having been bound, just like we saw in Matthew 16, it's a participle, in heaven, remember in Matthew 16, 19, where heaven was plural in all three cases. In this case, it is not plural. It is singular. Well, how is this different from the other one? The other one is talking about in the heavens where you are binding spirits in the heavens and the angels are working to accomplish that in the heavens. You bind them, tie them up, and you loose and untie their hole. This, instead, is talking about when you bind what is happening from heaven by the Father. Whatsoever you may bind upon the earth shall be, having been bound in heaven, Young's messed up. It's not a plural. He shouldn't have translated it heavens. He's wrong here. Whatsoever things you might loose on the earth shall be, having been loosed in heaven, again, singular, I don't know why he did, wasn't consistent there, but he sure made a mistake there. So what's this talking about? This is talking about, when, in this scripture, when you bind from your position on earth, that means the Father will be, the authority is going to be released from heaven that is going to affect this you have bound. It's coming from heaven's authority that it's going to be seeing this come to pass while the other scripture is talking about what the angels do when you bind in the realm of the Spirit. They go into operation to do that work. One is talking about what God does from heaven. The other is talking about what the angels do in the heavens to bind them. Just for you who may not have seen this, we'll just look at it briefly. Matthew 16, 19, I'll give to the keys of the kingdom or the rule and the reign of the heavens. This is talking about the rule and the reign of the heavens, where all the evil spirits are. Not talking about heaven where God is. Remember, this is the one of the ones for heaven. They're all three of them are all plural. Whatsoever you might bind on earth shall be, having been bound in the heavens, plural. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be, having been loosed in the heavens. And who does this binding in the heavens and the loosing in the heavens, the actual work? The angels. This is different because this is talking about the authority that has been released from heaven when you did it, but it's talking about how God is going to re do accomplishing this work through what you have spoken. Because this is talking about shall be having been bound in heaven, talking about God the Father, it's releasing authority. And we can even see this because the whole context is about, about what the Father will do. Again, I say unto you that if two shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall, iteo. Remember the word iteo means it's number 154 in Strong's. And here is the exact definition of 154, a demand of something due. So we're talking about anything that they might demand of some, what's due them according to the scripture. It shall be done, or it shall come to pass, come into being, for them of my Father which is in heaven. So this is talking about the Father doing it, just like the other scripture was talking about. The authority from the Father in heaven is going to see this be accomplished. And then the next verse is an interesting verse that much tradition has been taught about, unfortunately. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Many people have thought, oh, when two or three of us are together, that means he's in our midst. It's not, he's not in your midst just because two or three are gathered together. It's because of his name. That's why 
because when you do things in the name, he is manifesting himself. He is in the midst. Can two or three be gathered together and talking about worldly, sinful things and doing evil things that are born again? Yeah. Is he in their midst? No. <laughs> this is someone who's doing something in his name, which brings him personally present and active on the scene. Remember, it was the name through faith in the name that made that man strong, came on the scene to manifest the authority and the power. So this is talking about when you're doing something in the name of Jesus, you're seeing God manifest himself. There am I in the midst of them, and he will manifest himself and bring forth promises. Then we come to verse 21. Then came Jesus, Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Is there a limit how long I have to forgive this guy that <laughs> keeps sinning against me? Jesus said, I say not unto thee in seven times, but until seventy times seven. Essentially, perpetually, 490 times or so, but perpetually. You always forgive them. Now, that means I forgive a person for whatever they've done always in every situation. Doesn't matter if they do it 20 times over. I forgive them every time. There isn't a limit that I'm not going to forgive them. I'm going to forgive them, period. Now, the other thing you've got to realize, does forgiveness mean that I restore fellowship with them? No. Forgiveness is one thing. Restoring fellowship is another thing. I forgive them for the evil that they did or the wrong thing that they did. If they don't repent and get right, am I going to restore fellowship with them? No way. Say, well, what scripture can I look at then if, if I'm forgiving this person? Well, you've got to look at all the scriptures together. You can't take that one and make a doctor. Some people say, well, you've got to forgive me. You've got to restore fellowship to me. I didn't say that. It just I have to forgive you. It doesn't say I have to be or do anything with you. I forgive you. That's it. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. See, we've got to look at all the scriptures. Now we command you. Not a good suggestion if you feel like it. Command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. If they haven't repented and are walking right, sorry. Oh, I forgive you, but I'm not going to be in fellowship with you. Some people think that, well, I'm supposed to forgive you and just act like everything's fine now. That's error. Don't fall for that lie. Until there's been real repentance and fruit evidence of it, they're not a candidate for fellowship until they come in line. That's just to help you so you don't get off track and people try to tell you you've got to restore something when they've done to you just automatically. No, they've got to get in line. Matthew chapter 18, we come down to verse 23. He talks about a certain king that took account of his servants. Began to reckon one was brought to him. He owed him 10,000 talents. He had a big debt. And he didn't have to pay. We had a big debt of all of our sins, and we couldn't pay anything to get rid of him. His Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children all he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down, worshiped, and said, Lord, have patience or long suffering with me, and I'll pay thee all. And what did his Lord do? The Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, loosed him and forgave him that debt. He forgave him. Now the Lord has forgiven us of all of our sins, hadn't he? The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, the guy who had been forgiven. Owed him a hundred pence. Now that's not much compared to 10,000 talents. That's a drop in the bucket. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat and pay me that thou owest. Ah, what's the fellow servant? He fell down his feet, besought him, saying the same words. Have patience with me, and all, or long suffering with me, and I'll pay thee all. Did he react the same way the other guy did? No, he would not. He went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. <laughs> well, that means if God's forgiven us of all of our sins, how can we not forgive someone of whatever sins they have committed against us? His fellow service all was done. They were sorry, went and told the Lord, what, came and told the Lord what was, what was done. The Lord, he called them and said, You wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest now thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. 
His Lord was wroth and delivered him the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And what does this mean? So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother that trespasses. Well, that tells us something. When we forgive, it's got to be genuine from the heart. We're not holding anything against them. We're not just going through the motions. We're not doing it because I ought to or should or have to. I'm doing it from the heart. It's genuine. Then if you don't, you'll be turned over to the tormentors. People say, well, I forgive, but I still feel all this unforgiveness toward them. Well, that doesn't mean you haven't forgiven them. You may have genuinely forgiven them, but why do I still have these feelings and thoughts and all this stuff? Yeah, I might even have dreams of things against them. That's because of the demons that are in you. You've got to cast out the demons of unforgiveness that came into you when you were unforgiven. Forgiving is one thing, casting out the demons is another. That's why people say, well, I forgave them. And then I had these thoughts, I forgave them again. I had these thoughts, I forgave them 20 times over. Well, 19 of them were a waste of time if you generally did it the first time because it, it was genuine. The demons were just beating you over the head, giving you thoughts and feelings of unforgiveness, deceiving you, making you think you didn't forgive when in reality you did. What do you need to do? Cast out the unforgiveness spirits and make sure you don't yield to any unforgiveness, of course. So, at the same time, what will happen if you don't? You will be delivered to the tormentors, and those, you won't be able to get those demons out of you at all until you have genuinely forgiven from your heart. You can try to cast them out forever. <laughs> Not going to work, because you have to do things that are right in the sight of the Lord. God expects us to make sure we have no unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, anger, hatred, holding grudges, whatever it might be against anyone. It's got to be genuine from your heart. Matthew 19, verse 13. They were brought unto him the little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked him. Why would you hinder him from praying for little children? They're important. Everybody's important, remember. Suffer little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. And these are all commands that he's given unto them, commanding them that they should not be doing these kind of things, of hindering. Everybody's important. Matthew 19, 17, he said unto him, Why callest me thou good? There's none good, but one that is God. If thou wilt enter into life, if you're willing to enter, a, this is an a, a infinitive, into life, as Young's brings out, keep the commandments. Otherwise, what's, gonna be a, what's the requirement for us? Keep the imperative mood. Keep the commandments. We're to keep the commandments of God. Follow the New Testament commandments. Remember, we're not under the Old Testament. We're under the New Testament. We follow the commandments of Jesus Christ. Well, this guy, what was his problem? He had some idols in his life. It was money and possessions. Matthew 19, 21, he said how he kept all these commandments. But Jesus said, well, if thou will be, will to be, if you're willing to be, again, we see a, a infinitive there, perfect, perfected, go, command, and sell, command that thou hast, and give another command to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, a command, and follow me. All these are commands. Well, what was the problem? He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What was the problem? They were an idol. They were a source for him. Is it wrong to have possessions? No. Is it wrong to have finances? No. It depends on whether they have you. In this case, it was idolatry. This guy had, it was an idol for him. We come down there, and Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Didn't say he couldn't, because it's hard. Hardly enter. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Does that mean if I'm rich, I can't, I'm, I'm, it's going to be very hard for me to get in? Well, we have to understand why that's so. Matthew's account doesn't tell us, but Mark's account does. Mark's account, and when he said in verse 10, chapter 10, verse 23, how hardly after shall they who have riches enter in the kingdom of God, the disciples 
were astonished at his words. And Jesus answered again and said, Children, how hard it is for them to trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. So what's he talking about? Trusting in riches. If you trust in riches, you won't be able to enter in. That's what it's talking about. That means that's an idol in your life instead of trusting in God. We cannot have our trust in anything or have any other idols before us. There's nothing wrong with having finances. Don't let it be your God or your source. You cannot serve God and mammon or riches at the same time. It doesn't work. We also go back to Matthew. Many things that are said that are important for us. Matthew 19, verse 29. Everyone that's forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Well, that means you haven't let anything be before the Lord. You're going to walk in His ways. You're going to do the things that He wants you to do in every situation. That is what we should be doing in every situation. We don't let anything hold, hold us back. And notice says, many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. We can't let anything get in the way of serving the Lord. You've got to put Him first place in all things. And we're not going to let anybody ever hinder us. We're going to do what the Word says and then we're going to, it says here, they receive a hundredfold and inherit everlasting life. Then we come to chapter 20, and we come to verse 4, where he talks about the over here, verse 1, about the man that's a householder, went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. You and I are to be a laborer. He agreed with the laborers for a penny a day. That's what, that was what they were to get. He sent them into his vineyard. He went out third hour, found others that were idle, and go into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I'll give thee. So they went. He found some more, did the same thing. Comes to verse 7. They said, because no man's hired us, he said, go into the vineyard and whatever's right, that shall you receive. And then in verse 8, the evens come, the Lord of the vineyard said to the steward, call the laborers, give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. When they were come the hired for about the eleventh hour, they every man received a penny. That's what he told them he was going to give them. But when the first came, they supposed they should have received more. They likewise received every man a penny. You're going to get a reward for being a laborer. Period. You need to be a laborer for God. Those that are not laborers are going to be in trouble. Remember the one who doesn't do anything unto him, he gets cast out. But the one who's done something even to the least of them, then he's going to be entering into eternal life. You and I need to be a laborer. We'll see that scripture at a later time. We need to be a laborer for the Lord and carry out what he says. Oh, they were murmuring, griping. That was a mistake. He comes to verse 16. He said, the last will be first, the first last. Many be called, but few chosen. The only ones that are chosen are the ones that will be a laborer. You need to be a laborer for God. He wants you to be giving out the gospel carrying out the work of God, doing the things, laboring for Him, working for Him. We are ambassadors for Christ and we're to be carrying out this work. Amen. Verse 26, He said, It shall not be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, the one who is a, a servant. The greatest is the servant of all. Whoever be your chief among you, let him be your servant. We need to be servants. God wants you to be a servant, never exalting yourself whatsoever. So important. Then we come to verse 29. And he says, They depart from Jericho, a certain, a great multitude followed him. And what we see, we see these blind men getting healed. There's three different cases we're going to look at, and they're all different. They're not the same. Notice, they're departing from Jericho here. That means they're leaving and here's where the two blind men came. We'll come back to this one in a moment. Over in Luke's account, it's not talking about when they were departing. It was talking about when they were coming to Jer Jericho. 
came to pass as he was come nigh unto Jericho. He just coming into it. So this is the first one that happened. A certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. Hearing the multitude pass by, asked what it meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth passed by. Jesus, thou son of David. Oh, that meant he knew who he was. He was the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, which is the king bringing the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God into manifestation. And so what's he going to do? He's going to command his, the rule and reign of God to manifest mercy to him. That's exactly what he does. Have mercy. It's a command, not a request. He's commanding him to have mercy on him. Oh, they went before him, rebuked him. They didn't like him doing that. He should hold his peace. He cried so much the more. The son of David, have mercy on me, another command. He wasn't going to be denied. Don't let anybody ever get you, didn't try to get you to stop from coming to take hold of the promises that belong to you and make demands of what's due you. But Jesus responded to the demand. Jesus stood, commanded him to be brought unto him, and when he was come near, he asked him. Jesus commanded, notice, he commands everything. What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. It's interesting that when he says that I may receive my sight here, he recognized there were conditions that had to be met. Even though he was making a demand, subjunctive mood, he realized the conditions had to be such. They had to be met. Jesus said, receive thy sight. Of course, what does Jesus do all the time? He makes a command. And then he makes the statement, thy faith hath saved thee. And where was his faith shown? Because it was his faith that caused this to come to manifestation. And it's interesting that it's a perfect tense verb, meaning action completed in the past with present results of the time he's speaking. I mean, your faith, which had been in operation in the past and evident right now at the time of speaking, has produced this salvation for you. Well, what was it in the past? Because he heard who Jesus was. He knew he was the son of David. He knew he had a right to the mercy. He was making demand for the mercy. He was not going to be denied. He was coming to receive that. And he was understood conditions had to be met. And apparently he'd met all the conditions. And so therefore, his faith produced the salvation of the Lord, which was he received his sight. Immediately received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. You're going to make demands. You're going to meet conditions. And you're going to see God bring forth what he purposes for you in your life. We go back over to Matthew's account. This is when he's leaving now. As they departed from Jericho, so this first guy gets blind. He gets, his, he's open, his eyes are open. Behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside when they heard that Jesus passed by. This is when he's departing out. <coughs> crying, have mercy on us. Same thing, same command. O Lord, thou son of David. They had the same revelation. Maybe they even heard this blind man got healed. Well, we're going to get healed too. We're going to get set free. The multitude rebuked him because they hold their peace, of course, and they just kept saying, have mercy on us. They weren't going to be denied either. You cannot let yourself ever back off of taking hold of the promise and making demands until you see the results come to pass. Jesus stood still, called them, and said, what will you that I shall do unto you? They said, Lord, that our eyes might be opened. Again, these guys are declaring. They're understanding that there's conditions to be met, subjunctive mood. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes. Immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him, and they got healed. They were calling out to receive from him. And then there's one other case that happened as they were going out of this place, and this is over in Mark chapter 10. In verse 46, 
they came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out the same thing, oh, son of David, have mercy on me. These guys knew what to do. The king's here, the rule and reign's here, I'm commanding mercy to come into me, which is the love of God in action to bring healing, because mercy was healing. Imperative mood again, commanding these things. Oh, they tried to shut him down again, same thing, hold his peace. He cried a great deal more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still, that got him his attention, of course. When you make commands, that'll get attention. And he commanded him to be called. Jesus does everything by commands. And they called the blind men, saying, be, good, be of good comfort, arise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment. What was that all about? Well, the blind had to have a certain garment at that time. They had to have it on them. I'm not having this garment anymore. I'm not going to be blind anymore. So he got rid of that thing. He rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said to him, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? Again, he wants to hear somebody verbalize what they come for. The blind man said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Same thing. Each one of these guys understood subjunctive mood. There's conditions. And these guys said, I understand. I have to meet all the conditions. You've got to meet the conditions too. Jesus said, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Ah, again, this is a perfect tense. What was his faith shown by? He recognized who he was, the son of David, the king, who's going to who rules and reigns. He's making demand for the mercy to come forth, and he's even showing forth, garment, you're out of here. Throws the garment to the side and comes to receive. Your faith has made thee whole. And Jesus, of course, command, makes a command, go thy way, immediately received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. We must understand, you have the right to see the promises of God come to pass. He is the king who will bring his rule and reign manifest in your life. You make demands for the mercy of God to come to pass and take hold of it in your life as we see in the New Testament. You meet all the conditions. God will bring forth through your faith the manifestation. Your faith will receive your restoration, your healing, your deliverance, whatever it might be. That is what God wants for all of us. We come down to Matthew chapter 21. Jesus is constantly giving commands, and I keep pointing this out to you so you understand. That's the way he functioned. Here he gave command to these guys, Go into the village over against you. Straightway you find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. These are all commands. Bring them unto me. A command, this is. He's making commands. Jesus makes commands. You make commands. Disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. You and I obey commands, and we make commands. Yes. The realm of the Spirit operates according to spiritual law. you got to get this over to your mindset. You're a commander, and you're an obeyer of commands. If you don't obey commands, you're not going to be in any position to come do any commanding, unless you've met the conditions to see things come to pass. Matthew 21, verse 12. Jesus went into the temple and cast out all that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the table, the money changed, and the seed of them that sold doves. He went and cleaned house. You and I clean house on every evil thing that's in us because we're the temple of God now. He said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. God wants us to be a mean of ones that pray. And then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. It's interesting. First he cleansed the house and then they all got healed. You've got to cleanse yourself, and then you'll get healed. You'll get healed and set free from the bondages of the enemy. Verse 19, he saw a fig tree in the way, came to it, found nothing thereon, leaves only, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. 
He said that it might not, this is not a command here, he's making a statement, that it might not grow on thee henceforth. Now why is that? When it says forever, that's not correct. It is for unto aeon the age. Why is he, who's he talking about? Who's the fig tree nation? The Jews. Why does he say, let no fruit, no fruit might now grow on you. Why? Because they rejected what he said for three and a half years. And remember, the 70 weeks was God's dealings with the nation of Israel. 69 weeks, they hadn't listened. Jesus comes and ministers for three and a half years, they still won't listen. And they're gonna you can cut him off, he's gonna die. As a nation, they're cut off. Individually, people can come to the Lord, but as a nation, they're cut off until the end. When the last three and a half years that parallels the tribulation, they get their last chance, and they are going to get saved, it says. They're finally going to be turned from ungodliness and receive Jesus. The fig tree withered away. The disciples saw it and said, how soon is the fig tree withered away? And of course, Jesus said, if you have faith in, then he goes on and said, if you have faith in doubt not, shall not only do this and done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast, and see it shall be done. Speaking commands again. You and I speak commands to see things come to pass. Over in Mark's account, it's interesting what it says, and it doesn't give a right translation whatsoever. Mark eleven twenty two. Jesus answering said to them, and this is after what we just see, the fig tree being withered away. Jesus answering, this is all in the same context. He says unto them, not have faith in God. That's not true. Because there's no in, no preposition for in. And when it says, have faith, it's a command, imperative mood, have faith, that's not in God, it's a genitive. In the genitive, it means of God. But there's no the in the middle of it. It didn't say have faith of God, have the faith of God or have faith of the God. It just says have faith of God. In other words, you could say it another way, have God's faith. That's the way you can say a genitive with no, no uh, definite article. Otherwise, he's commanding you and me, have God's faith. You're, you have, you're supposed to have God's faith operation in all times. Do we get God's faith? We sure do. We have the spirit of faith, the faith of Jesus Christ. You got God's faith and you're to have God's faith in operation. Have his faith. Literally, this is a present tense imperative, meaning be having continually God's faith. If it's continually operating, it means you're putting in operation. Your faith is working. And then what's he do? He immediately goes into talking to them about what they do with the mountain. You say to the mountain, be thou removed, commanding words. Be thou cast in the sea, commanding. You can't doubt in your heart, but you believe those things continually, that you, what you're saying continually are coming to pass, remember. We've talked about this many times before. When he says the things that you say, these are the things that you're saying continuously because you continuously speak to the mountain to be removed until it's removed. And when it says shall come to pass, that's a mistake. Not that it shall in the future, no. That it is coming to pass, present tense. It's happening now every time you speak it. If you don't know and believe that it's happening now, you're not in faith. You're not having God's faith. You're just having hope mm -hmm. in the future. God's faith is what speaking what is happening now when you're put in operation. And he says, you'll have whatsoever he saith. And then he goes right over into verse 24. Therefore I say unto what things whoever you make a demand to what's due you. I tell you, not desire. Remember what I tell you means. Strictly a demand of something due. Number 154. 
What things whoever you make a demand or what's due you, I tell you, when you pray, believe, and believe is not just try my best. It is a imperative command unto you and me. Present tense. Believe that you take hold of them. Present tense. Every one of these are present tense verbs. And it's not you shall have them, but actually, more literally, it shall be unto you. Literally what it says, like what Young says, it shall, it shall be to you. It'll happen. It'll come to pass for you. That's because we and I have faith. We're to have the faith of Jesus and put the faith in operation to see things. The same thing, we didn't look over at Matthew's account, the second one in Matthew 21, verse 22. We saw verse 21, but verse 22, all things, whatsoever you might make a demand of what's due you, subjunctive mood, not shall, it's iteo as well, in prayer, believing, which is what you're supposed to be doing, of course, present tense, continuously, you shall take hold of it, lambano, and that is a future tense because you are, you shall take hold of it to see it come to pass. You're supposed to take hold of every promise. Everything is supposed to come to pass in your life of all the promises, every one of them. In fact, whatsoever is not even a good translation because it really is this word which means as much as, as Young's brings out. And all, as much as you may make a demand of what's due you in prayer believing, you shall take hold of it. As much as you take hold of it. Don't leave any promise out. Take them all. Be taking hold of everything that belongs to you. God wants every promise to come to pass. And I want to look at something that also covers the area of faith and show you something. You have, you're to have God's faith and to move every mountain. Look what the apostles came and said to Jesus. Just because they said it doesn't mean it was the right thing. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. This is the word which really means to add. Add to us, more literally, it's the word add. As Young's brings it out, it's exactly what it means in the Greek. Add to us faith. Oh, wait a minute. He already told them, you're to be having God's faith. Be having God's faith. Why would they be asking, add to us faith? That's a denial that you even have God's faith. They shouldn't have been asking that. But that's what they were saying. Because they didn't even, they were an unbelief, remember, these guys were. And not, they hadn't developed themselves like they were supposed to. And the Lord said, if you are having imperfect tense, if you were having, the way you translate that, faith is a grain of mustard seed. Well, why would he say that? They're saying, add to us faith, and which they shouldn't have been saying because they already were told to be having God's faith. Jesus is correcting them. If you were having faith as a grain of mustard seed, mm -hmm. which is what you already got, yes. you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. You'd speak commanding words. Do you have faith as a seed? Yeah, they had, uh, they had faith. They had God's faith. What were they supposed to be doing? Put it in operation. And they were saying, add to his faith. They didn't believe they had faith. He's correcting them, straightening them out. And then he further says, he can shows faith is like a servant. Which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he's come from the field, go and sit down to me. Your faith is your servant. It serves you. It brings forth your promises. It conquers all the enemies. It's what you walk by and live by in everything you do. What do you say to your servant? You don't say sit down and do nothing. No. no. I'll not rather say to him, make ready wherewith I may sup. Gird thyself, serve me till I've eaten and drunk, and afterward you shall eat and drink. Does he thank that servant? He did the things that were commanded him? I trow, or I think not, literally says. So likewise, when you've done all those things that are commanded you, we're unprofitable servants. We've done that was our duty to do, which is what? Your faith. That's the whole subject. 
In other words, you put your faith in operation, it'll work for you as a servant. Instead, they were totally wrong. Add to us faith. They didn't need to be, have faith added to them. They needed to use what they had as their servant and put it in operation. Don't ever think that you need God to give you faith. You already have it. You got the faith of Jesus. Well, I need more faith. I hear people pray that all the time. Pray for me to have more faith. No, I'm not going to pray for you to have more. I refuse. <laughs> That's unbelief. I'm going to pray for you to come out of unbelief. I'm going to pray for you to use the faith that you have and understand and believe and put it in operation and see it become strong by use. Put it in operation. That is what God wants. He wants every one of us to put our faith in operation and see God accomplish everything that he purposes. One last thing that we're going to cover just before we stop for this morning. Matthew 22. Jesus would speak in parables. He speaks about the kingdom of heaven's likened to a king that made a marriage for his son. Ah, that brings us thinking about the end with a marriage. Send forth the servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, but this is prior to that. He's calling all these ones, hey, come, this wedding. They wouldn't come. Who all was that? That was the Jews. Send other servants saying, tell them that are bidden, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, all things are ready, come into the marriage. Ah, they made light of it, went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise or his trade. The remnant took his servants, treated them spitefully, and slew them. They just rejected everything. The king was wroth, sent forth his armies, destroyed the murders, and burned up their city. What happened in 70 AD? <laughs> they got destroyed, and their city got destroyed because they, would, they rejected everything because the Jews missed it big time. Then he said to his servants, the wedding's ready, wedding's ready. They which were bidden were not worthy. They didn't, the word bidden means called. They wouldn't respond. Go therefore in the highways, as many as you find, bid them to the marriage. Find anybody out there and call them to the marriage. Find everybody. Servants went on the highways, gathered all as many as they found, both bad and good. Now we're going to stop here for a moment. Who is able to come to the Lord to be able to come to the wedding? Does it have to be someone who's already cleaned up their act, repented of all their sins and are good? No. The bad and the good. He takes us as we are. It doesn't matter where you are. Remember, he's not imputing or charging our sins against us. Anybody that says a person has to repent first of their sins before they can come to the Lord and be born again is a false teacher of the gospel. Yes. It's wrong. No. The bad and the good. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whether they're the murderer or whatever they might be. The wedding was furnished with guests. The bad and the good came in. You get born again, you come in. Are you going to stay that way? No. You got to clean up. God's going to do a work. Verse 11. The king came in to see the guests. That's all the people, the ones that came in. And this implies the work is to be done in every person once you come to the Lord, because he will deal with you. And you've come into covenant, and he's going to show you how you must walk. He saw there a man which had not on, and duo, had not clothed himself, perfect tense, meaning completed action in the past with present results of the time of speaking, meaning this work was supposed to have been done and showing forth that it's done at this point. For himself, because it's a middle voice, he didn't have on a gar wedding garment. He didn't do what was necessary to get this wedding garment put on. Well, that's righteousness and holiness and getting all the uncleanness out and having be a righteous garment. He said to him, friend, how camest there in thither not having on a garment? A wedding garment. It's interesting. He says, friend. You know, when I looked at that, I thought, as I'm reading this again, I wouldn't call this guy a friend because he didn't clean up. Who's a friend, by the way? 
We'll come back here for a moment. John 15, verse 14. You're my friends, philos, if you notice the word below, if you do whatsoever I command you. Had that guy done what he commanded him? No way. So is he really a philos? No. Well, they translated it, friend. Well, let's find out if it's philos. No. It's heteros. Heteros. This is a different word. This is the same word that was used in Matthew 26, verse 50, when Jesus is being betrayed by Judas. Jesus said to him, heteros, not friend, why have you come? What does this word, this heteros word mean? It doesn't mean a friend. And we'll show you. We'll look at the, in the Greek for a moment just to show you this. This is in Laonida's lexicon. Notice down here on the left where it says, a person who's associated with someone, though not necessarily involving personal affection. Otherwise, that doesn't mean I like the guy or I'm pleased with him or I'm, I'm gonna, he's, a, he's okay. What was the association? He was a disciple. Just, you know, uh, that this guy was, uh, uh, um, Judas was a disciple. But did he meet the conditions? Was he someone who had, would have personal affection? No. He was betraying him. Is this guy someone who is going to have personal affection? No. Why? Because he didn't obey God's commands and put on the gar wedding garment. But these guys are all people that came in to the wedding. They were guests which implies they were all born again. Remember, they both bad and good come in and now they're here. So this means all the born again people, this guy's a guy that's born again who's not a friend who keeps the commandments. He's a heteros. He's a guy that had association, but no affection for this guy because he didn't do what was right. In other words, the whole teaching is simply this. You could be born again, but unless you are put on the wedding garment, you're not a, a philos, you're a heteros, and you're in trouble. He didn't have his wedding garment on. He's speechless. What happened to this guy? He said to the king, to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hmm. He's sunk. And look what it says. How you know that this is someone who responded to the call of God because it says they responded to the call. They got born, it was implying they got born again. Many are called, but few are chosen. All the born again people who responded to the call, if they don't get the wedding garment on, they won't be chosen. They won't be a philos who keeps the commandments of God, friend. They'll be a heteros, someone who has had association with you, but no affection for you, you get cast out. This destroys the one saved, always saved teaching for sure. This also destroys the teaching that says you've got to repent of all your sins before you can come to Jesus. No, both bad and the good came. But you don't stay that way. You got to get the wedding garment on and clean up. So the teaching is we go out and get people who can be born again and then get them in the Word and then so that God will do the work in them and clean up and we get our wedding garments on so we'll be a real friend and we will be ready for the wedding because the wedding garment is those who are righteous 
and holy before the Lord. Praise God. And as we see, many are called, but only few are chosen. We will be one of the few. Remember, the few walk the straight and narrow, while the many walk the broad way that leads to destruction. You're going to be one of the few. We're all going to be one of the few because we're walking the way of the Lord and doing what He has told us to do. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, I thank You and praise You for the Word of God that brings revelation of the commandments and the sayings of Jesus Christ. I see the commands that Jesus continually gives in the Word of God and His sayings that I am to hearken to. And I see those that came for the promises, made commands, and met conditions, and their faith received healing and miraculous works. I will be obedient to the commands, meet all the conditions, and I will make commands, taking hold of every promise, moving every mountain, seeing God accomplish everything. My faith will receive everything that belongs to me as I command and make demands or what are due me. And I take hold of promises and I meet all the conditions. And I will also understand I'm called to the wedding. I've responded by receiving Jesus just as I was. And now he's at work to do the cleansing work. I'm putting on this wedding garment, God's clothes, for myself, so I will be righteous and holy. I am being cleansed so that I will be right. I, who am called, will be one of the chosen because I've met the conditions of seeing the Lord accomplish His work in my life. I thank you, Lord. I'm obedient to the New Testament commands and the sayings of Jesus. I'm one of the few, and I'm going to see God accomplish everything in my life. I thank you. You're performing it as I hear and do the word. And I know it's coming to pass because I put you first place in all things. Because I am a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God for the great work he's accomplishing. It's being done. It must be done or we're in trouble. It will get done. You just put him first place and do what he says and follow his commands. Jesus had to follow the Father's commands. You and I have to follow the Father's commands and sayings and put them in operation. Just do everything he says. Remember, you deny yourself. You're willing to come after him. You deny yourself. You lose total sight of your interests and your, what you want. And you do everything that God wants. And you crucify that flesh daily so that sin doesn't operate through the flesh. You walk in the spirit. You follow him. You destroy his soul realm directed life. You put him first place in all things. You're going to walk in the spirit. You're going to walk in love toward everybody. You're going to forgive everybody. You're not going to hold anything against anybody. You're going to do what the Word says. And you're going to conquer every enemy in your life. Father, I thank you that you have ears to hear. We'll be hearers and doers of your Word. And we will see this tremendous work be accomplished in our life. And truly, we'll be one of the ones that are chosen. Thank you for performing your Word in our life as we're hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name.